God shouts to us in our pain. Because I am a paraplegic, uh, you learn something, and that is pain is your friend. I can be doing things that are harmful to my physical well-being, and because there is a lack of sensation, there is no pain, uh, I don't realize it. All right, welcome back to Door Church Connect. We are jumping in the deep end with Pastor Warner, Harold Sword Warner Third. the Third. Yes. And uh, we're going to continue doing this. Hope you brought your life jacket. Uh, Pastor Garrett, let's go. Yeah, uh, let's just get into this. I want to talk about pain mm. and trauma and uh, low points of ministry. I, I want to get into some, some deep waters, the, the reality, I guess, yeah. of, of life and ministry. I read a, a book recently uh, that is very discouraging uh, <laughs> by a man named Samuel Chan called Leadership Pain. And he, he talks about pain as the classroom for growth uh, in leadership, that it's, it's through pain that you learn life's greatest lessons. And there's a lot of truth in it. It's, it's actually outstanding, the, the points that he brings up in there. But he references an organizational guru in that book named uh, Peter Drucker, who observed that the four most difficult jobs in America are, and in no particular order, the president of the United States, the, a university president, a hospital CEO, and a pastor, mm. which is remarkable that, yes. that uh, they would recognize uh, the, that on the list of top four uh, most difficult jobs in America. And he goes on to speak specifically about leadership, and he, he, he makes a statement. He says, you're only going to grow to the threshold of your pain. In other words, your ability to go through things. When I, th I thought about this in reference to the Apostle Paul, all the things that he went through formed him. They shaped him. He went through some very painful things. He had to work through those things and they shaped him. It was a classroom for his personal growth, uh, even to the point of where he would minister to people that were against him, you know, personally coming against him. And, 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 uh, remember, uh, I think I was reading this morning, Corinthians, uh, where he's, he's talking to them about this offering he's bringing back to the, the Jews of Jerusalem. Well, it was the Jews of Jerusalem that were actually against him in a lot of ways. They were the, they were, uh, the ones that were going to end up putting him in <laughs> prison in Rome <laughs> eventually, but he was making this collection of the saints. He had this incredible burden for these people, uh, in, in Jerusalem. And so but that was painful. The, the, there's a lot of things that happen in, in ministry and life that are painful. And, uh, and, and I want to get some thoughts on that uh, this morning. Yeah, what Caesar said, it's easier to find a man who will volunteer to die than to find a man who, find men who are willing to endure pain with patience, which I think it's funny coming from mm. the guy at the top of the power structure. But have you man, how, how have you managed your emotions uh, throughout life and through your experiences uh, rejection, physical pain, betrayal, the whole nine yards. How do you manage Harold S. Warner when Harold S. Warner doesn't want to be managed? Yeah. Well, uh, it was C.S. Lewis who said, uh, and I, off the top of my head, the first part, I don't remember, but it's the second part is that God shouts to us in our pain. In other words, he whispers here, but he shouts to us in our pain. And so, um, you know, I can relate to that on just many, many uh, different levels, uh, just uh, physically, because I am a paraplegic, uh, you learn something, and that is pain is your friend. Hmm. And, uh, you know... Uh, I can be doing things that are harmful to my physical well-being. And because there is a lack of sensation, there is no pain. 
uh, I don't realize it. Right. And so uh, it was Philip Yancey, Dr. Paul Brand, in their book, uh, where it comes from Dr. Brand's uh, work amongst uh, lepers, that leprosy isn't just this uh, bacteria that starts eating your body away. It uh, damages the nerve endings in your body. So, you know, you, you could be trying to turn a screwdriver, but because there's no sensation, there's no pain, you can be basically, you know, breaking down your skin, your flesh, and uh, this is what happens uh, over time. And so... Uh, I don't think any of us are going to get through this life without uh, pain and scars. It, uh, when I said earlier that life is a full contact sport, that's what I'm, you know, is that uh, there are going to be uh, painful seasons, there are going to be uh, things that happen. You're not going to get through this life without scars and uh, it's like uh, Jacob who after wrestling with the angel of the Lord it uh, it he walked from that point on with a limp and so you have the loser's limp which is people who use uh, the limp uh, as an excuse uh, no, I can't do this because, you know, X, Y, or Z. But you have the limp that is just the result of living life, and uh, it uh, will beat you up at times. And so this is especially true, and probably the reason he put uh, pastors in that list is you're talking about managing in leading a group of people, all of whom have different personalities, they have different uh, upbringings and persuasions, they've got their biases, their prejudices, and uh, trying to see them uh, have uh, ultimately the mind of Christ is, uh, is uh, from a human perspective, a very, very, if not impossible, job. And so uh, my uh, uh, opinion is that without God, without the Holy Spirit, this is Im an impossible uh, job. You don't, you know, number one, if you're not called, if you don't understand what that calling may involve, uh, you know, Jesus said... Uh, deny yourself, take up your cross. And so that is identifying with him, but it also means that uh, the cross was a painful, excruciatingly painful experience. And so uh, how do I manage uh, people and my emotions is that I am especially, the longer you live, I relate so much to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul is talking about his thorn in the flesh, which people have tried to figure out what it is. Uh, they, you know, they said he had an eye disease, uh, uh, because in Galatians, some of you are willing to pluck out your eye for my sake. Uh, uh, they've suggested all kinds of things, but uh, in reality, whatever it was, uh, it uh, he said a thorn in the flesh to buffet you. And this is, uh, you know, how many of us like to be punched in the face? Uh, not many. But he's praying, you know, God remove this. And the one word, two things, is my grace is sufficient for you. And I uh, would uh, 
say that the one thing that I've experienced and learned over decades now is that God's grace is sufficient. And sufficiency uh, involves and applies to every aspect of life. And then he spoke about that what he learned is that God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. So, uh, you know, there, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the testimony that we've gone through and uh, the first uh, pioneering attempt and uh, an accident ending up in a wheelchair, it, there's, uh, there is a divine comedy here. It's almost like, and I've always believed this, is that, God, you're doing a work through some very weak uh, individuals so that in the end, no one would be, uh, uh, would think that you've done this. Yep. They would realize this is something God has done yes. uh, through uh, weakness and through pain. And so I have, uh, you know, if you talk about emotionally, uh, first, uh, men and women are very, very different hmm. in how they process uh, pain. And, you know, when you're the warrior and you're the champion, you know, pain uh, goes with the territory. You know, we talked about when I played ice hockey, one of the points of uh, uh, pride about uh, NHL hockey players is uh, playing uh, with or through pain and, you know, they can get smashed in the mouth and lose a tooth. You know, you always see the hockey players that if they don't have their mouth guard in, they smile and they're missing teeth, but they go in to the dressing room and they come out and they play the next period. And they always, there is an element of kind of pride in that. They say, well, that's because he's a hockey player. So uh, you have to realize that this, you know, the the element of pain, and, and it's in a variety, it's uh, actually a multitude of different areas, goes with the territory called life. Yep. You, you know, it just... It is a reality. I said earlier, in the world, Jesus said, you will have persecution. And so the one thing, and uh, uh, Garrett reminded me of it, uh, is uh, to survive emotionally, you have to manage your highs and your lows. Right. And so you can't get too high. This doesn't mean that you live with uh, the fear of, okay, what's around the next corner? Because, you know, if you have that mentality, life is uh, impossible. But, you know, I rejoice and have had some incredible highs. But then there are also the lows. And so managing the lows so that... Uh, you know, you don't get too high and you don't get too low. Uh, and the North Star uh, that enables that is God's grace, which is sufficient, keeping that there and uh, saying, you know what, I've got to push through this because that's what life is about. I like hearing this from you because it's not, this is not just theoretical yeah. for you. This is not just something you read in a book or some cute stuff that you know how to say. Um, this is a 71 year old dude who's been through it, capital mm -hmm. I. And um, when you say God's grace is sufficient to some people, it might ring hollow. Like, oh, okay. Just quoting scripture. You're not just quoting scripture. No. This is, this is your life's mantra. Well, yeah, you've experienced it. I, I remember reading somewhere, 
uh, and it's it said made this statement: never trust a leader that doesn't walk with a limp. Mm. Mm. And um, write that down because uh, I'll use that in a future project. Absolutely, it's all yours. Um, and and the the I think the dirty little secret for for Pastor Warner's men that are out in the field <laughs> that that may not be shared with you, but I'm going to expose this yes. secret right now. I remember living in Gabon and going through some very difficult uh, times. And uh, every time I would think about picking up the phone and calling you to, to complain about something going on in my life, I would thought, I would think to myself, this is going to be so stupid. Like I'm going to complain about something to Pastor Warner, who has gone through so much. He doesn't just walk with a limp, he rolls with one leg. Like right. there, there's like, there's not even, like what are you gonna say? And, it, and, it, and it's not that if I called you, you wouldn't be extremely gracious and 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 speak to my need and, mm. and as you have so many times. But it was this like, okay, you know, suck it up, buttercup. Like, you know, get your stuff together, son, and 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 play the man, and 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 move through this. Your pastor's gone through, and and we have that uh, that ability to not just be checked in our spirit or challenged in our spirit, but I think the other side is that we have the 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 privilege of your compassion mm -hmm. because you've gone through it, that, that you understand it. I, I think about Christ, you know, mm -hmm. Christ is the one that said, take up your cross. Mm -hmm. He's also the one that went to the cross. We have a high priest that's been touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but yet he's also the one who walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death, that these two dynamics have to be at play in effective ministry, which is that look, man, this is real life. Like welcome here, but also I'm going to hold your hand through the dark places yeah. and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work you through these hard times. Yeah. So there's nothing like uh, talking to someone who you know has been through some of the similar things that you're dealing with. And when he or she says, you know, I understand what you're talking about, uh, that uh, uh, resonates. And uh, that's why you have to have people like that in your life. Yes. And uh, it is of immense uh, comfort because ultimately uh, what we go through and uh, what we learn is for our benefit, yes, but ultimately it's for the benefit of others. And so I love the scripture in 2 Corinthians where uh, God, uh, the God of all comfort and the Father of all mercies comforts us in our tribulations so that we may be able to comfort others in their tribulation. So it's uh, realizing that, wait a minute, what I've learned, what I've experienced, uh, I can communicate that, impart that, uh, be present uh, when others are uh, going through those things. Yeah, you communicated to me at, at a difficult time uh, that I was going through two things that stuck out of my mind. You and, and this, I learned how you process certain things. Number one, you said, I'm not in control that I've realized that I am not in control. And number two, you said there's always far more good going on in your life than bad. Yeah. And, and, and so you've obviously learned those over the years, but w what expound on that a little bit on those two things and, and how those help you process things? Well, the, you know, early on the illusion of control was right. shattered in my life. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, human beings, that's uh, the things that we have direct control over are very, very few. Yep. The one thing we do have control over, and that's why uh, that statement uh, that life is not about what happens to you. It is all about how you respond 
to what happens to you. And so I, at the beginning of the pandemic, that was one of my, that was the final sermon before we had that short uh, live stream only period was on the illusion of control. And uh, the sense that, Lord, all that you've done, you've kept me, uh, the invaluable contribution of the prayers of the saints. Yes, yes. Uh, I personally believe I am here and I am sustained by the prayers of the saints. Uh, and so when people tell me in different places all over, you know, Pastor, you know, we pray for you regularly. You know, I don't take that lightly. That is, to me, an amazing gift. Yeah. And if those prayers in Revelation are a golden bowl mm. full of incense, and, you know, uh, the only uh, way I can relate to that is uh, how that in the early hippie culture, incense was a big thing and having... Uh, but. He's saying it's a fragrance that is well-pleasing in, in God's sight. And so uh, I realize that, uh, you know, I am here because uh, of God's uh, grace, but I am here because of the prayers of the saints. And so that is something I so uh, value and uh, appreciate. And. When when we're talking about this, and, and and I want to move a little deeper into not just pain but trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, you've you're writing a book. Uh, you've you've been writing it for some time. It's not like you're just going to start right now. But yeah. what we're trying to do is put you on that final stretch, where a time where you can concentrate on it. We're going to take a break from the podcast. We're going to end season one. And uh, we're going to take some time off so that you don't have, it's an immense amount of work to put together one podcast mm -hmm. and you've been doing it every week along with your preaching duties. And uh, you're going to take a step back from those two things for a, a period of time to focus on writing this book, which we all feel God's placed in your heart. It mm -hmm. needs to be written. It needs to be done. And we want to give you that space to do it. But the book specifically uh, is about trauma mm -hmm. uh, and how you've processed it. You've experienced quite a bit of trauma. Uh, and you've also helped many people walk through their own traumas. It began with that, the car accident. Well, I'm sure it didn't begin here, but this was the, where we will begin. The car accident uh, almost 50 years ago. They landed you in a wheelchair. You've had, I believe, two bouts with cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, involved chemo, radiation. You know, I'm sure uh, the whole thing uh, there. Uh, you recently battled an infection. Uh, that uh, stopped you in your tracks, laid you on your side so you could relate to the prophet mm -hmm. Ezekiel uh, for almost eight months. Um, you uh, That led to the amputation of your leg. I remember uh, you calling me while I was in Gabon and you know, we were trying to be light about it in, in some sense, and you're wrestling with this decision. Do I stay here and, you know, you know, try to get this infection healed? And we were talking about, well, you know, you don't use your leg anyway. It's just dead weight. Maybe it'll make you go faster on the bike. And, you yeah. know, we were, you know, we were, we were lightening up the mood a little bit and talking about it. And we, we didn't realize. Called dark humor. Dark humor. Yes. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of that. And, uh, <laughs> and I actually read that, uh, uh, and I have, I have it in my file, that uh, dark humor usually belongs to those with a higher IQ. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know what my IQ is. Uh, you must is. be a genius. That's yeah, so. <laughs> Gabe is the smartest among us, though. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> we like our humor like we like our chocolate around here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, and then when you had your leg amputated, uh, I think we lost more than we originally thought. We didn't realize 
the balance issues, you know, I mean, so many things that you already struggled with and you'd found a way to live life and the adjusting to it, how much longer it takes you to get ready in the morning. And, you know, you're, uh, uh, you, you lost a lot of uh, independence that you had so freely worked with for so, so long of a time. Um, there's, there's a lot going on. So you've experienced a lot of trauma. And, and in light of this, um, as you're going into the book, as you're reflecting into this book, how have you processed this trauma? Because pain, you know, can come and go and there's various things, but, but trauma is something that it just hits you out of nowhere at times and it, it can, it can destabilize you and, and, and it can, could you give us some keys and some insight? And a lot of times I notice we're, I look at things in your life and I think, man, that's heavy. And you seem to look at it like, well, that's life. You know, you have a different way of processing it, which you've already alluded to, but can you expound on that a little bit more specifically? and how it relates to trauma. Yeah, I, you know, uh, when I told you about the uh, shoulder doctor because uh, I've got uh, full thickness, uh, complete tears of uh, my supraspinatus in the rotator cuff and other things, but he said, your whole life has been about normalizing what is abnormal. And so that isn't a passive uh, uh, response. That is a uh, determined, aggressive response. Yes. Um, And so, you know, some of that has just been uh, natural to, okay, how am I going to live life? How am I going to be productive? Uh, And uh, so... The uh, the using of trauma to write uh, this uh, book is simply uh, because uh, my real passion is the history of what God has done in our fellowship. But there's no way you can tell that story unless... uh, you're a master historian and can put together this uh, masterpiece. So all I'm doing is taking a small lens called trauma to tell a bigger story, Hmm. which is what God has done Hmm. through in the midst of all of those things. And so... I was telling uh, Gabe yesterday, I wish I had uh, the, I do have in my file the actual name of the Russian dolls, which is uh, traditional Russian art where, you know, they have, uh, they're usually made of wood and they have somebody's face or picture on it. It can be anyone. But you unscrew the top and then you take out a smaller. Smaller. And then you unscrew, take out a smaller is that uh, what I feel is that I'm the smaller doll within a greater one Mm. and then within an even greater one. So you have... Uh, My life uh, dealing with uh, uh, normalizing what's abnormal. But then you have the story of the miracle of the church, which is the bigger doll. Yes, yes. You know, it's not me. I'm the smaller doll. And then that fits within a bigger doll, which is God's purposes and uh, his plan for people's lives. And so that's the challenge, that's the task, which is to use some of those things as a lens to tell a bigger story. So here's a loaded question, kind of a grenade, Mm -hmm. but uh, what was the lowest point in your ministry? Yeah, I saw that, and... uh, you know, uh, I thought about it and I would have to say, um, for me, uh, the lowest point was, and I don't know what year it was, but uh, that season where there were a lot of men who were, you know, linked together 
uh, in uh, brother bonds and common purpose who then, for whatever reason, uh, left uh, the fellowship. So, you know, it's easy for some men to get up and refer to them as, you know, the departed brethren, which is kind of a derogatory little dig. Uh, you know, these aren't just, you know, these were people who helped and had a real part in the building of our fellowship. Yes. And uh, just because uh, of longevity, uh, many of these were, you know, my brothers. They were people who had... Uh, you know, significant impact in my life. So they have uh, chosen, chosen a different trajectory. And it wasn't that I uh, wavered in my convictions. I was very steady in the fact that, wait a minute, God has placed me here for his purposes. And it's not just about me. It's about... Uh, you know, dozens and hundreds of other younger pastors and other men, I, you know, uh, I'm not going to take other people's offense uh, and use that as an excuse to jump off the cliff. So I was uh, very steadfast. I had no, uh, uh, you know, inclination of uh, moving in another direction but uh, these are uh, these are men that I uh, serve God with mm. these were men that we grew together in the gospel so you know I don't know if it's uh, uh, company policy or whatever but I just uh, uh, you know, some of that is I grieve over that. I don't uh, uh, agree with some of the reasonings, etc. But it was something I had to go through. And uh, uh, with people who had been my longest friends yeah. and co-workers, but uh, saying, you know what, I'm remaining steadfast. Uh, there were rumors and, uh, you know, because I didn't take the posture of just uh, let's renounce them and let's uh, tear them down. I didn't make it uh, the focal point, but it was a horrible blow, not just to me personally, but to our entire fellowship yeah. uh, because they are part of our history. So... Uh, I'm not alone. You know, when the Apostle Paul is talking about in 2 Timothy about, you know, come to me quickly. And in that context, he said, uh, for Demas has forsaken me. Having loved uh, this present age is uh, that is a, uh, a reality that they don't teach you. Uh, necessarily when you're uh, being discipled. They definitely don't teach it in uh, Bible school, and that is how do you process, how do you manage uh, the pain of uh, betrayal or lost camaraderie? Right. So, uh, you know, and I may get in trouble saying this, but... That's not, um, you know, we I'm can edit it out. I'm always in trouble, but uh, Mike Kyles, uh, for instance, talked about uh, he was saved under Kurt McKinney's uh, preaching when he was uh, serving here on staff. And my response to that is you know what? Uh, uh, I need to give Kurt props because he served admirably. Uh, there are other, you know, so it's kind of processing those hurts, those 
it's it's actually like a grieving process. Yeah, you said grieve like present tense. Yeah. Like there was no ed at the back of that. Yeah, I mean, no. is it still something that's that's with you? Uh, yeah. It, in other words, I uh, you know because these people were uh, part of my life. Uh, I mentioned uh, Ron Jones, who was with me in my accident. Well, you know, uh, his barber shop that his dad, Joe Jones, ran in Prescott is, was a kind of uh, little gathering place. And so when I uh, decided to cut my hair as a hippie, which was a big move because, uh, uh, you know, uh, l- you know, long hair was... Uh, hippie symbol and uh i actually uh, copped out and instead of cutting it all off uh, halfway but i look like you know a girl with a bob <laughs> and so i finally went back and uh you know said cut it all off and uh you know, uh, Ron Jones, his wife Marie, let me stay in their house and for a period of time, and uh, constantly remind me that uh, you know when I took off my shoes and let them uh, left them by the front door that they stunk horribly. <laughs> you know, uh, I you know you can't deny those things, but. I know what God has for me. I know the course that he set out for me. And even if those things uh, occur, you know, I uh, like uh, Acts chapter 20, Paul said, uh, none of these things move me. Neither do I count my life dear unto myself. He didn't say I don't count life dear. But it's not just uh, about me. And he said that I might finish the course and the ministry that God has given to preach the grace of God. That's been the, the, uh, the North Star through all of these things. When I, and I, I think it's a, it's a mark of your ministry. I, I, you know, if I were to sum up, Pastor Warner, I'd call him the big picture pastor. You know, you, you always have the big picture in mind. And the biggest picture is, is your eternal focus yeah. where you, you're, you're, when you, we're not just trying to get people to the altar. We're trying yeah. to get them to heaven. And the reality is that people don't take the straight line from the altar to heaven people make mistakes. There's betrayals. There's, uh, there's, there's, there's hurtful things that happen, things that are said against people, things that hurt the church. There's violations that occur against God's people. And, and it's such a fine balance for a pastor when you're protecting the flock, but you're also remembering that this person is also a soul that has, that was placed under my care. And, and I have to con- be concerned for them. We're just talk to Anna Miller, you know, mm-hmm. who found refuge in the same church with the same pastor. She left decades earlier, but, but here's my point. She knew she could come home. Yeah. Even when she was backslidden, she knew her son could call pastor Warner. Yeah. And it, I think it speaks to, that eternal focus and and what I've noticed watching you is even in the darkest times that I've experienced with you, with betrayal, with criticisms, you don't shut the door on people. You don't give up on them. You don't stop believing God for their souls. You don't stop reaching out to them. You don't stop calling them and saying, I'm praying for you. I'm thinking about you. This person's been backslidden for 20 years and they're still on your mind and God still brings them to your heart. But you have to have an eternal focus if you're going to be able to pastor people that way. Yeah, yeah. without it, uh, you will not uh, survive. And so... Uh, one of the important uh, verses and chapters is Second Corinthians chapter 4, and the bookends, the beginning and the end of that chapter, deals with that eternal focus. And so he begins by saying, seeing that we have received this mer- uh, ministry, 
So he's talking about something sacred, something very important as we have received mercy. So, hey, none of us are going to make it without mercy. Yeah. Uh, as we have received mercy, we don't faint. In other words, we don't crumble, we don't give up. And then he goes to the end of the chapter where he said, though the outward man perishes, yet the inward man is renewed day by day as we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. And so, uh, yes, you have to have a, an eternal perspective, which means uh, seeing the invisible, mm. uh, which he is saying are the things that really matter. And so... You know, I carry with me the responsibility that one day I'm going to have to stand before God. Yep. And I'm going to have to give an account of my life. And uh, whether people think uh, uh, Pastor Warner is a, a big deal or a good uh, preacher or pastor, in the end, none of that matters. It's what does God say? And that is... Uh, the dream and the desire that all of us have, which is well done. Yes. Thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. So, yeah. uh, yes, uh, to go the long haul, uh, you have to have that. Uh, so I don't know if this is jumping ahead or uh, I already knew that uh, these episodes would all be longer than originally conceived. But one of the chapters, and it could be edited and changed, is uh, my wheelchair is at the finish line. And so where that comes from is uh, all of the hand cycling and uh, uh, wheelchair races that I've been in. So if you take... Uh, the Tour de Tucson, for instance, and uh, I started out uh, in the beginning when I was a lot younger. I'm going to do the whole 109 miles. I remember that. Yeah, I, I think, did it. Yeah, you were there. <laughs> number of times. <laughs> yeah, with and you. And then I, you know, I said, well, maybe I'll do the 82 mile one uh, uh, that starts out uh, on the east side. And then they had the 52 mile and then the 35, you know, so I changed it up. But in every one of those cases, they took my wheelchair, which is, uh, you know, basically my legs, how I get around, and it's at the finish line. Mm. And I don't care what your mind says, all kinds of things. Yep. Uh, my wheelchair is at the finish line. I've got to get there. And I've got to get there. <laughs> yes. And so like it or not, you know, whether it's pleasant or not, whether your mind is uh, screaming at you, you're an idiot. Why are you doing this? And, you know, cranking, you've seen it uh, thousands and thousands of times. It's always with the knowledge that, hey, my wheelchair is at the finish line. Yes. And uh, when I get there, I can, you know, uh, you always feel like I'll never do this again. But when you accomplish it, then you think, well, that wasn't so bad. You know, I could, uh, you know, you're doing it and say, I'll never do this again. But when you finish, yeah. you know what, I think I could do this again. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, uh, yeah. So the, that mentality you know, I relate that to eternity, and that is my reward is at the finish line. Yeah. And so God help me to run the race with perseverance. Yeah, so that's outstanding. And I'm going to start to wrap this up. I have two things I want to ask you yeah. about as we have another 10 minutes or so of battery life before our cameras die. Through the years, you have forced me on a number of occasions to consider the wife of the pastor mm -hmm. in regards to ministry opportunities. And you've always forced my mind on that. You think about the wife, think about the wife, think about the wife. And a lot of people don't quite understand the importance that our wives play in the pastorate. Um, at times, uh, our wives can be underrated. 
They can be underestimated. They can be undervalued. We both know uh, that one of the greatest secrets to your success over these years is Mona. Mm-hmm. She is uh, one of my greatest heroes of the faith because I've watched up close and personal the things she does for you, the things she does for the people of God, for the church. And uh, it's, it's remarkable to me, her faith. But everything you've gone through that we've talked about, uh, she's gone through as well. Yes. Every pain, every betrayal, every trauma, every battle you fought, she's fought also. And on the flip side, she's been able to experience every victory and every success as well. Tell us what Mona means to you and to your ministry. I knew I would uh, come to this uh So I just, uh, and men and women are different, and I don't know what it is. Every time I've uh, preached uh, that sermon on three, two, one, when I get to this point, I just, uh, I lose it. So uh, because uh, the real hero in uh, my life, etc., is my wife, because she's paid the same price but I would say even a, a greater price on so many levels. And I said the other day, it's probably more fitting for a book than it is a, a podcast. But, uh, you know, one thing in uh, just in the pastoral side is I've really tried to shield her from a lot of the, you know, I'll take the arrows you know the jabs, etc., and I don't, uh, I don't uh, go into detail and share those things with her because uh, women are different; they process things uh, on a much more emotional level, and I don't want her uh, messed up. I want her to love God, to love the ministry, yes. uh, and so I try to guard her from some of those things, but always with the, uh, and you know this, and a lot of other people do, is that the greatest uh, caregiver in all the world is my wife. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, in the book, The Survivor's Club, which is uh, somewhat similar to what I want to write about is uh, he goes into great detail about the burdens that caregivers uh, go through, which usually they're overlooked uh, because they think, well, uh, you haven't personally gone through the trauma. Well, yes, they have, just in a different way. And so he does great justice to uh, those kind of people because trauma isn't limited to an individual, especially in a marriage. It affects uh, both husband and wife. And so our joy has always been serving God together. And uh, it's not a burden. It is a joy. It is a privilege. And so, you know, I just uh, do my best to If it's not dealing with her, if it doesn't directly, you know, it's, you know, she doesn't need that. Uh, You know, she needs to just uh, know and believe that uh, God's people are the greatest people on the face of the earth uh, and uh, love them and love that. And uh, so, but in the end, when the story is actually told, the uh, real hero yeah. in all of this without question. And it is true in every one of our lives is that uh, that's why the Bible says whoever finds a wife. We're looking at our producer we're now. We're looking at our producer. Whoever yes, finds a because, wife. Because uh, there's been uh, great progress in that area, but we'll save that for later. But whoever finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And so, so much of God's favor, which we desperately need, 
comes to us from our wives. Yeah, and and we all know as much as we love you, Pastor, that the bigger crown and the bigger mansion oh, in yeah. heaven it belongs to Mona. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, the people that uh, you know they they've heard from you for fifty years. The people are going to want to talk to her. They're going to want to say. Well, it, <laughs> and it is so it is so true. When I go to places to preach. They always ask, is your wife here? Yeah. No, she doesn't, uh, she didn't travel with me. And so there's disappointment. But uh, if she did, uh, obviously center stage of uh, people's interest so, is so going to be her. Opposites attract. Um, Mona is not you. She's allergic to solemnity. She, if something's too quiet, something's too serious, she's going to blow it up. Yep. Um, how has that kept you going? Be, being married to your total polar opposite. Yeah. Well, I really do look at it as a fantastic blessing because uh, there is such a difference. Uh, I remember... Uh, when she used to play in uh, uh, one of our music groups, it was her and Nancy Kirkpatrick. And so we had a 70s night rock and roll or something. <laughs> and so they teased her hair. They put in uh, braids. They did all of these things. And uh, uh, I remember going to a minister's meeting because, you know, they always want to say, you know, you, you people at the door, you're so exclusive. It isn't that at all. It's just, you know, I'm, we're really busy. We're really involved. But I thought, you know, I'm going to reach out. I'm going to be uh, available. And so on one occasion, I took that picture of her <laughs> uh, in uh, rock and roll regalia. And uh, yeah, this is my wife. <laughs> so th there's more truth in that picture than uh, people realize. And so, you know, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. And so, uh, listen, if I had have been married to a dour, oh my gosh. sour, uh, cynical woman, I wouldn't uh, be here or she wouldn't be here. Uh, and so that polar, that polar opposite element has been a, a joy and that uh, you don't hear uh, Lots of complaints. Did yeah. she really break you out of the hospital right after you uh, uh, got in, after accident? Did she roll you down the street? Well, it wasn't her. That was uh, because, you know, uh, rolling down the streets of Phoenix, lying on a gurney uh, required strength. So that was uh, Greg Johnson who broke me out. And so I'm laying there. I think I had my... I guess it's okay to say my chonies on, <laughs> and uh, Some, with with a as long as you say it in Spanish, it's really, okay. It's fine. <laughs> with a hospital sheet uh, covering me, and uh, I don't, you know, a t-shirt or whatever, and uh, yeah, we broke out and went uh, uh, through the streets of. Uh, Phoenix and uh, I, th I think that what you're talking about the critical elements and dynamics that Mona brings to your ministry I mean so many so many there's so many expectations on a pastor's wife there's yeah. so many demands that are placed on a pastor's wife and what I love about Mona is and 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 Sarah's learned so much from her is that that no you serve your husband and you serve yeah. the church and and whatever gifts God has given you or not given you you use those to minister to the people of God and to minister to your husband. Yeah. I mean, God's called, I mean, partners. That's what we are. And we have strengths and they have strengths and we have weaknesses and they have weaknesses and they complement each other. And it's a, for me, it's been a beautiful thing to watch your marriage because you'll be as serious as possible and she'll pop in and just. I, I don't know if serious is. Uh, yeah, very serious. serious. Yeah, serious? Yeah. serious. You're, you're trying to drive home a point <laughs> and she's popping off about. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, something, but it, let's wrap this up because I know we are running out of time, but yeah, I will say that, uh, the other blessing is that the 
current popular church uh, paradigm where you have a uh, pastor and la pastora, yeah. Uh, yeah. where, yeah. Uh, you know, the husband and wife, uh, she's preaching, etc., and he, that expectation, I don't believe, is biblical at all. Yeah. Uh, you're right, and that is, uh, and I've told what your responsibility is to love your husband, uh, yeah. minister to him, and love the church. And if you do that, you're a success. Yeah. If you're speaking to the Tucson congregation, last last thing I want you to to leave us with: mm-hmm. What things was, must we guard above all else? to continue growing in the grace of Christ as a congregation and remaining focused for the next 50 years or until Jesus returns, whichever comes first. Speak to us, the Tucson church and pastors abroad that, that you well, would Well, I thought about that because I'm already uh, thinking about a conference in our new building and that there will be an anticipation ex- and excitement. Uh, people will be in Tucson when it's not uh, living on the surface of the sun. November is yeah. starting to get uh, beautiful. But, uh, you know, I'm sorry, but I always reference everything back to the Bible. Thank you. Amen. Always. And uh, Acts chapter 2, the book of Acts is my, you know, one of my favorites because it shows the Holy Spirit at work in and through the church to accomplish uh, God's mission. But uh, when you ask that, I don't think you can improve upon the Acts chapter 2 model. And actually, in this uh, Bible, my preaching Bible is uh, the New King James Version. And that uh, portion they have a title that says a vital church grows. Mm. So church vitality, how do we remain and uh, maintain a vitality is uh, in this uh, passage, and I'm not going to go into all of it, but it says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Mm-hmm. or teaching. You asked earlier about sound doctrine. They, and the word literally means they devoted themselves mm. uh, to the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and fear, uh, prayers. Then fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done through the apostles And all who believed were together and had all things common. And it concludes by continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And so my... Prayer, God, let there be a continued vitality, mm. not just a, you know a church on whatever corner, but vitality is uh, people who remain devoted to the Word of God. They remain devoted to fellowship which is uh, our commonality of life and purpose and realizing that God has taken this uh, amazing uh, mural of different people and personalities and link them together. Uh, I do believe that we're blessed because our roots run so deep in so many areas And they continue, they're contending to see God real, the supernatural element of God's presence. I love Mike Kyle's last uh, episode talking about uh, that when he drove into the church parking lot, he started feeling 
what he didn't, what, uh, the presence of God, although he didn't know it was the presence of God. And the closer he came to uh, coming in the mm. doors, the more that intensified and then stepping into the service. Uh, oh, you know what? If we continue to have a vitality and uh, a liberality, uh, this is not communism. Uh, it is community. All who believed uh, had all things in common. There was a spirit of liberality, yes. generosity, which is not just money. It's uh, all of life uh, and continuing daily, uh, being faithful with one accord in the temple and from house to house. There was a joy. There was a gladness and God added to the church daily, such as we're being saved. Uh, if we hold to that model, if we make that our prayer, our vision, uh, the thing we're contending for, uh, which <laughs> no human personality can pull off. It is a work of the Holy Spirit. Yes. But it says a vital church grows. And so that's my prayer that you have younger uh, generations, uh, that they would have a vitality about them, about their faith, about their love for Christ and the truths of the Word of God, that uh, if that happens, you know what? I will be eternally uh, grateful. Amen. Well, Pastor, on behalf of thousands of people around the world that reference uh, your life, your ministry. I want to say thank you. Uh, we're grateful uh, for you, for your life, for uh, the fact that you care for the church of Christ the way you do. Uh, we thank you for pioneering and never stopping. Yes. We thank you for your faithfulness to God, for your faithfulness to Mona and her faithfulness to you. And your faithfulness to the churches of God that he has graciously placed under your care. Thank you for creating and, and curating this podcast that yeah. allows us to minister to people all around the world. Thank you for your time uh, these last six episodes and for sharing your thoughts with us over these uh, number of episodes. Next week, we'll be wrapping up um, season one. And uh, talking about season two, we'll be bringing in our producer, uh, Mike Harry, and discussing that as well. So that will be next week. But Pastor Warner. And we probably should talk about his uh, relational breakthroughs since it's, <laughs> been a, it's been a subplot through uh, the last, uh, what, 40 Six weeks. I say, I say we let it play out a little longer. Yeah, let's we, let's leave them hanging yeah. until season two. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's good things happening, folks. Uh, <laughs> more good than bad. <laughs> on, yeah. Amen. So, hey, Pastor, I would not, I don't want to correct you, but I, I will say this: your wheelchair is not waiting for you at the finish line. Yeah. No, it, it, it's not. The, the Lamb sitting on the throne will shepherd them and lead them beside living water, yeah. and He'll wipe away every tear from every eye. And it will be well with our souls. Come with us. Walk with us. We'll see you next week.